podcast or classes. Wow. So um, you can watch them anytime you want to. Really? Yeah, you can. Uh, I can share the schedule. I can share the schedule with anybody. And then afterwards, it gets archived to YouTube. So you can watch them anytime. Really? You watch every class we've had this semester. There's all these screen share and stuff like that. So if you know anybody that wants to learn Clinkit, they have a computer. Um, they sit on Facebook all night. They can kind of spend an hour a day just studying Clinkit. All the materials are on the website, uh, clinkit.info. Uh, it usually takes us a little while to get in a rhythm, especially lately. Um, but we usually get started about 10 after, 5 after. Uh, sometimes one time. And then uh, there's usually Shkugik in Fairbanks and Yech uh, Kla, she calls in from the White House. And then uh, we get Han Kei calls in on the phone from Ketchikan. Right. Starting next semester, it'll just be Monday, Wednesday evening. But uh, since we have a couple of uh, guests today, I thought we should start with introductions. I think they're fairly new to the language, so uh, there's a chance to show them a little bit of clinket and also just tell them who you are in English as well. Uh, David Russell Johnson, uh, Two um, um, you think we know this is Alicia Oscar. You just hit some Yeha to the song. This thing you come territory for. Uh, no way, get her do so. How do you say I, I like the who are? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try. Masa Eati Age Ayahat Yosal, Dr. Wadi Ayahat, Kuan Man Kai Kwan, Janak Teddy Yari, Dr. Wadi Yari. I don't really know it, that's all we're going to do for us. Do it in English. Um, my cooking name is Keith. I'm Daisy Tom, uh, from Daisy Hid. I live at the house. Um, my English is pretty long. Okay. Uh, I'm Daisy Tom, I'm from Daisy Hid. 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 I'm from Daisy Yes, to tell you how to solve a late car in a colleen. Yes, not at city, a coastal sailish quan car cohitan. Not at city, Dachlewedi yadi. Coastal sailish Dutch can. A grunus cheese. Hatsa <laughs> Day 
Thanks for coming, you guys. Uh, it's awesome to see you. A little uh, pep talk is um, like it should never be a scary thing. You know, I know sometimes people get nervous about coming and, and sitting in on classes, but we're really trying to literally keep the door open and invite folks to come and just so people feel like this is something we, we should be doing. And that uh, yeah, as far as pronunciation or, or doing things wrong or not knowing things, like this is a it's a good safe place we try to create where um, you know and I try to get students to not apologize for mistakes, to, to be conscious of mistakes, but to just sort of not feel like you're you're offending anyone or hurting anyone just for trying. Because the more we try, the more we realize we get there. Uh, we try to have a, a sort of environment where we're not aiming for perfection. We're just trying to communicate, learn how to just sort of say some basic things. A wide range of emotions. Uh, and try to have fun. We try to have fun with the language now and then. Uh, I think Thursday for our last day of class, we're going to go through our words. Uh, I've been working on the recordings for you guys. I think Thursday we're going to try to play a game. And we'll see how it works with people on the phone, people online. All will have to be like the, the game manager. We'll see. I'll, I don't know how it'll work. I think it'll work. Uh, also, we, we try to just sort of uh, focus on the things that we're doing right and take a lot of time to understand the cultural components of language. And we also take time to understand the sort of the basics of Klinkit linguistics as well, so that we, we analyze the language and how it functions. And it's a foreign way to learn the language for a lot of our fluent speakers. But I believe doing the things that we do here, balancing it with time spent with fluent speakers, just engaging in the language, and you could go a long ways, two to three years you can really find yourself doing an awful lot with the language. Uh, it's it's a really complex language. There's a, a whole lot of moving parts to it. Um, but we're trying to get away from, you know, there's a group of teachers, we're trying to get away from saying it's hard and it's difficult. And we just like to say it's complicated. Um, it's very fun. And things we've been talking about here is how I think it is always categorizing the world. You know, this is this type of thing. This is that type of thing. Um, and one of the things that we'll talk about today is it's not a time-driven language. Um, English is sort of a time, you know, when did it happen? When did it happen? English, you know, Clinkit tends to focus on more whether or not the thing was completed or not. By the thing, we're talking about verbs. And so the way that verbs function in Clinkit is really quite different. The other thing that we talked about, so if we say, uh, let's say snow, Snow is a noun in English. It's also a verb. It's going to snow. Right? And so, dafusitan means to precipitate. So, if you say, well, I guess those verbs are too difficult. Let's try see. We can do that. So, like in English, you could say to see something. Right? Like I see a dog. So, if we want to conjugate that verb a whole bunch of different ways, we could say, I see a dog, I saw a dog, I will see a dog, because I saw a dog, if I see a dog, let me see a dog, I won't see a dog, I didn't see a dog, I don't see a dog, there's no way I can see a dog. Um, and so there, there's, there's quite a few ways we can conjugate it in English, but see and saw is really all we're doing with the verb, maybe seeing, like I'm seeing a dog right now. So the actual verb itself only has two or three, or sometimes four forms. Now in Clinkit, and then you just sort of add words around it. Will, won't, did, didn't. So conjugating verbs, it, it's a pretty simple formula when getting into English. With Clinkit, all that stuff gets built into the verb. And there's a root of the verb, which is near the end, and a whole bunch of stuff that piles up in front of it. So the front is where kind of all the action's at. And that's where we're going to conjugate for 
from the time or, or whether it's happening, and we're also going to conjugate for the person here. The other thing that we like to, you know, so we're starting to take a closer look at verbs in here. We've been talking about this weather for a while. And some of the things, like in English, if I said, um, I would say, he kissed her, right? But if I specify, Johnny kissed Susan, right? Or Johnny kissed Jimmy, whatever. But what happens is the pronoun goes away. Right? So if we were speaking, if we are using English, if we want to speak English and start using some clinket grammar, we'll always keep the pronouns there. He kissed him, right? But then we would say, Johnny, he kissed him, Jimmy. Right? So even if we specify who is doing it, right, it's chasing it around. The dog, it's chasing it, the cat, around. So some of the things is the pronoun never goes away. I know. The other thing is the pronoun never gets separated from the verb itself. And so we start thinking about grammar that way. So we say, okay, the pronouns are always there. Think about that and think it, that no matter what, you know, I told him uh, Bob, right? And so you can specify later, but specifying stuff is outside the verb. It doesn't matter. So this is why you can say, we do should give us enough with Kate. And I think, you know, and it, it's hard. So the cat chased the dog. But if we're speaking English, that's probably how we would sort of construct it. I think it, you could move those subjects around any way you want. You would put a marker on it to say which one's doing it. We douched with Kate Trig The dog is the cat is chasing the dog. Um, the other thing is you'd say uh, he kissed him. But if we were to use it, you know, more clinket grammar in English, we would say him, he kissed, she, he kissed. So instead of going subject, verb, object, we're going to go object, subject, verb, every time. And so that's it's non negotiable. When you're specifying who's doing it, you can move them all over the place. <laughs> the dog ate my homework. Right? So you're saying, my school work. It, he, or she ate the dog. The other thing with Clinket is when you get into pronouns, especially third person pronouns, it could be he or she or it. So it's very powerful grammatically because you could just say, you know, if we were speaking English, and let's say for whatever reason there was like a moose in our classroom and the moose was studying with us. And in English we don't really talk to moose. Uh, so a lot of times the default would be it. Unless maybe we're hunting, right? Because then we'd be like, we'd specify he or she. I don't know. But, you know, we might say it knows, he knows, she knows, she knows, he knows, she knows. So in, in, in order to speak English, I've got to look at someone and identify their gender every time I want to sort of talk about something. But in Clinket, I would say, absuku, 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 absuku. So the verb itself doesn't change whether it's a male, female, or an animal. Right. Animals are just conjugated, and are just basically. And it's also it, so you could say, team. how is it? And that could be, now I could specify anything after that. I, I could say, or wasawuti, how was it? Wasawuti, yeah. How was your glutton day food? Right, we can ask that. Wasawuti we kui. I was the kui. Wasawuti we governor inauguration. Right, so we just have to just throw English in there. And, and I, don't, I think it's fine to use a lot of English when you speak in Clinket, as long as your push is for more Clinket grammar. If you're using the English grammar, then you know, that I think you're better off using English nouns in Clinket grammar than Clinket nouns in English grammar. Right, so you could say. Akha told me about it. Right? So now you're speaking much less Klinke. And you can say, my mom, Akhine, I would much rather have the second where you're really pushing yourself into those verbs. And this is the this is the process of learning Klinke. So you're building up this these lists, lists of nouns, lists of uh, ways to modify nouns. It's not a whole lot. There's a few adjectives, maybe about 25. And then you're starting to build up these other sets. Body parts, kinship terms, 
Uh, body parts are really fun. And we talked about, we did these things where we're naming these lists in here, like we did. What's the first one we did? Birds. Birds. Right? Maybe walking animals. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then birds <coughs> and sea animals. Right? So we just see, just to see how many we can name. Last year we were doing that in a class, but then we did body parts. It's like, let's just do body parts. And we did really spontaneous. We didn't um, have a whole lot of fun. Maybe I gave me time. So we're going around and we're naming body parts. And the really fun part is body parts in Clinket can have body parts. So you could say, Aksha. You go touch your head and say, Aksha. 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 Put your finger, Ach. Ach. It's your fingertip. Ach, ek, sha. Ach, ek, sha. Ach, ek, sha. It's your upper arm. Ach, chik. Ach, chik. Ach, chik. Ach, chik. Ach, chik. And touch your shoulder. Ach, chik, sha. Ach, chik, sha. So the sh, there's also, you touch your knee, anywhere around your knee. Ach, key. 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 So it's really, and then, then there's quite a few more, you know, and there's some, like jikhe is uh, the inner arm, and then ach in teich is heart, ach jikhe teich is like the heart of my inner arm, that's your bicep, that's when you flex it. Right. Um, but we're doing this thing around, going around, and when we do this game, we will call it whatever gachtush sa. We're going to name, let's name whatever. So you could say, Kada it gachtush sa. Let's name body parts. Atkatu it gachtush sa. Let's name the animals that walk around. Atkutu it gachtush sa. Let's name the things that fly. Hintak it gachtush sa. Let's name the things that are in the water. Nech it gachtush sa. Let's name the things in the house. Shingit ani kach ayi gachtusa. Let's name everything on the earth. But you can play these games, and the, the way the game works uh, is just like we've done in here, where everybody just says something. All you gotta do is name something, and you, you can't repeat it. So once it's been said, it's off the table. So we were doing that with body parts, and there was a student in there who might not have studied. You know, I think I gave him a chance to say, go study. <laughs> Search yourself. Search your mind. That's the way an elder told me. Go search your mind. Go study these things. So every time a body part came to him, he just said, shut afterwards. Right? <laughs> and it worked every time. Because then he had shoulder, he had thumb tip, and I think fingertip. And he did it like three times. And the person to his right who went first, Probably caught on to what he was doing. So when it came around that last time, he said, I think we use do. Because when, when you're naming body parts, it's just going to get weird if you're saying my all the time. Because, you know, it's an adult class. We teach all kinds of things here. There was a time when missionaries came in and really sanitized the Klinkit language. And so the, there are like thousands of verbs in the Klinkit verb dictionary. But if you go online to clinket.info, look under resources, there's a couple of things by Jeff Lear. One is called Verb Notes by Jeff Lear. One, it's all these handwritten notes of clinket verbs. Um, but there's a verb, there's plenty of verbs in there that you're not going to find in the Nash story verb dictionary. And if it's there, there's a verb for it. Like you could say, to um, cut sheet it. He pooped himself. <coughs> you could say that, but you, you're not going to find that verb in the verb. 
So anyway, so we're going around, and he's saying chef every time, and we're just sort of laughing. And then he does the third time, I'm like, that's kind of lame, but you know, we're just laughing, having fun. And then it came around to the person next to him, and he said, du chow, right? Oh. So his or her penis. Five things that you need to know about that verb in order to use it. What type of verb is it? And we'll talk about this stuff later. Now, especially next semester, we're going to start really unfolding this up a little bit more. I hope you guys are coming back. What type of verb is it? I think it has five verb types, and it matters what type of verb it is. So when you're, when you speak in English, even as you're getting your mind ready to just keep engaging in more thinking, you just say, well, what type of verb would <coughs> that be in clinking? So there's an act, an action verb, for somebody to do something. There's an event, or eventive verb, for something to happen. It exploded. There's uh, a state verb, for something to be a certain way. And most of these weather verbs are state verbs. And you know, we're learning this one type of verb. We're not talking about these types of verbs a whole lot yet. But it's for something, you know, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm wet. It's for something to be a certain way. And then there's motion verbs, for something to move. And then there's positional verbs, for something to be positioned somewhere. And the positional ones, there's really only about 20 of them. Right? The building is located there. The sea lion is sitting on a rock. Uh, and so it just has to do with where something is. And those are the easiest verbs in the world, because they don't they don't conjugate. They only conjugate for person. Like, ah, I'm located here, positioned here. E ah, you're located there. Um, so you need to know what kind of verb it is. And as you get further along in verb study, you'll figure out why. Every verb has a conjugation prefix. The conjugation prefix only pops up in certain forms. Uh, so some of you may have. Bed. Or some of you might have put somebody to bed. If you're telling somebody to go to sleep, because you'd say, Mutam, he or she was sleeping. But if you, how do you command somebody to go to sleep? <coughs> Nata. Nata. So you say, Nata. Nata day. Well, kids keep going out of bed. Nashta. But Nata. So what you've got there is the conjugation reveals itself in the command form. So na is one of these conjugation prefixes. There are four of them. Na, na ta. So to eat something, you'd say ha ha, I'm eating. Awoha, he or she ate it. Yeha, you ate it. But how would you command somebody? Ha, ha. Ha. Again, you're sitting at the table. Three-year-old and your one and a half year old and you're like, ha, ah, ha, she's cut, ha, shut up. No. So that one, <coughs> there's this thing we use a lot, and we see it on the top left there. It's called the zero marker. The zero marker means you don't hear anything, but there's something there. Ha, that's the command form. It's a zero conjugation. And how do you tell somebody to stand up? Gadahan. Gidahan, right. And so the conjugation prefix there, because you could say, Wudahan, he stood up, right? Mm -hmm. is ga. There's ga conjugation. So now we've got na, zero, and ga. And these last two are the only ones that seem to have some embedded meaning in them. Ga is for verbs that are have some sort of upward motion, standing. Going, you know, going upwards for some specific reason. Reaching up. Lift your hands up. You know, so it's got this upward motion. What about sitting down? How do you say, sit down? Mm -hmm. Anu, right? So that one is the underlined. 
and that is downward motion. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that, and it reveals itself in certain ways. And you have to know it, even though it doesn't pop up all the time. It affects the way we conjugate that verb, which is why it's called conjugation prefix. So as we go a little bit further, we just keep learning more of these linguistic terms. And that they help us to understand the language, but you have to be diligent with your own time outside of the classroom to make sure you're engaging in the language. You know, so next week we're done. But you know, if you want to see what the experience could be like, if you if you don't push yourself to engage in language, you know, or if I said, okay, don't speak English until we start again next semester, right? I mean, you, that would be crazy, right? And so don't do that with thinking. Find ways to continue pushing yourself in the language. Use it every day, even if you're just talking to yourself and you're trying things out and you're trying to think of. Yeah, and I, I do that all the time. If I see something, I think, how do I describe that? I was walking to intermediate clinket class uh, a couple years ago, and people were making snowmen. I just thought, huh. Huh. So I came and I said, hey, you. I just kept saying it. And they were like, you're making white people? <laughs> <laughs> I learned there's a, there's a different word for snowman, because I was really I guess, because then I was like, oh, uh, uh -huh. uh, you know, has something with sticks they were making with their hands, uh -huh. their arms. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Their eyes were rocks. But in no way, as to show, and then they, they started figuring it out, right? But it's plate, tin, kadua, chuhu, ha. People packed the snow. People packed it with snow in person. <laughs> I always thought that. I was really like, ah, oh, that's so wonderful. But, um, OK. So coming back to uh, these things, you need to know what type of verb it is. You need to know the conjugation. You need to know the root. So there's about four or 5,000 verb roots. Within that root, there's meaning. For example, teen. Teen, T-E-E-N to see something, right? And, and there's homonyms, too. And we get this just like run. If I say run, and if I say it's a verb, you don't know what it means unless I give you context, right? I get to say running. What does that mean? Like, oh, like somebody's running down the road? I'm like, no, the car's running. <laughs> Duh. Right? But you get it from context, right? Same thing with thinking. There's team to see. There's team to travel. We just learn this, you know, like, okay, that's that verb, that's this verb. Then you, then you get to the classifier. So as far as how this thing is structured, if we start on the right-hand side, the end of the verb, we call this, uh, let me put this up <coughs> to include this one. Pause. So this is a diagram here that shows uh, basically how think it verbal structure, what it looks like if we just sort of block it out. And so going from the left to the right, think it verb has an awful lot of things. Um, let me pull up the little blocks. So this is sort of all the possible locations where you could have something in a clinket verb. There's about 20. So if, if you said uh, this is a clinket verb, uh, and I tried to make these look like little toy blocks, so we could say, this is fun. We're building things. It's not scary. Um, you look right here, you've got the stem. This is, you have to have the different, you have to have these components for a thinking verb. Every thinking verb will have these components. They'll have a root and a classifier and stem variation. Stem variation means, uh, and we'll get to that later, um, you need, there's a couple things you need to know about it, but it's not the most critical part. Uh, it's just saying what that root looks like. So if you say T, like 
Yatin. The ending is long and low. Teen. Right? Kakwati. That's long and high. Keshutin. That's long. That's short and high. Right? So it's going to be one of those things. One of those three things. Long and low, long and high, short and high. And it moves back and forth. It's predictable. But then these are other things that might be there. Subjects, I did it, you did it, he or she did it, we did it, y'all did it, they did it, someone did it. Right? And then those are the basic options that you have. And then you, you move out from there and you get to number, there's a whole, there's quite a few different things. Throughout the course of the next couple of years, we'll just start unpacking these things, looking more and more at how they work. And then you get all the way out here and you get to objects. Right, so objects are like, it happened to me, it happened to you, it happened to him or her, it happened to us, it happened to y'all, it happened to uh, them, it happened to somebody, and it happened to something. Those are the basic options you have. There are a couple more complex pronouns, which I don't know when I'll ever teach them because I don't quite understand the function. But when you're telling a story, there's a specific pronoun to say, this guy that we've been talking about, and it's ush. He kept, he, and then he does this other thing. And then there's another pronoun for like, and then this other guy or gal who comes into the story briefly, but it's not that important. It's okay. Anyways, back to the symbol. So back here, we have the verb, the postverb, and the preverb. Preverb means any words that come before the verb, but that's part of the verb phrase. It in achwani. I told you about it. Iin is the preverb. Kachwanik is the verb. And then the postverb is not as common, but it could be some additional stuff that comes after. When we say like the verb phrase, it's all the stuff you need to understand the verb. Iin kachanik nuch. I'm or ich kachanik nuch. I'm always telling you, right? So that nuch part would be the postverb. When we get into now we break down the verb itself. We have prefix, stem, suffix. Stem is made of the root and the classifier. And that's what we're going to focus on today, coming back to these weather things. Uh, and what I, what I want to do, uh, we'll come back to the grammar stuff, especially next semester we'll get into more grammar stuff. But we'll also get into more conversations, learning more phrases, uh, continuing to develop more. So we'll shift the focus from nouns, because you can turn nouns on your own. That's something you should be doing. What's this called? What's that called? What's this called? Uh, getting to the classifier. To introduce the Clinket classifier, classifier to you, you've got the root which has the meaning. Right? So like T is to be. Wu T, it was that way. Ye Wu T, Ye Ya T, it is that way now. Ye Kwa T going to be that way in the future. So one of the things that happens is you've got T right there. Right in front of it, you've got a classifier. So if you can ever find the root, classifiers are always immediately to the left. Sometimes a little trickier to spot than others, but looking at this chart, you'll be able to find which one it is. So introducing what this chart does. The first thing you've got is on the left-hand side, you've got these four categories. These are the four classifier groups. Zero, S, L, S, H. They, there's way more zero classifier verbs than anything, I think. And then L and S are probably pretty even. There's probably more S than L. And then SH, there's hardly any. Right. Generally speaking, Zero kind of means for the verb to either occur or to just be in its default sort of state. S and L are going to either make it more specific to something or is going to assign some sort of um, agency to it. So what, they, what the classifier does, it, it talks about what the verb does, changes the verb's behavior. An example would be the zero group would be Yatin, yatin, to see something. So if we're all sitting around my house, and I say, this is my house, and we look out the window, and there's a dog. I say, I see a dog. 
That's all I'm communicating to you. I see just some dog. Not particularly important. But if this is the dog that keeps coming back, digging holes in my yard, chasing my cat, pooping everywhere, and eating my garbage, and this is like a nuisance dog, then I might say, I see that specific dog. So now we've jumped from the zero group to the S group to say, it's, I specifically see something. This is why you say, I see you. Because you're the specific thing, right? You are the specific thing. And it's the same thing. You could say, uh, someone might say, Were you drunk yesterday? Yes, I was. So it's just to be in a certain state. But if you say, you know, I'm a member of that group. So it's specifying something. Right? So it has this sort of saying, going from general to specific. And then if that dog is out there, and I'm saying, I'm not going to let him see my trash and poop all over the place and dig holes. He starts acting a fool, I go out and yell at him. So I'm going to tell you, I'm watching that dog. So that verb stem, that verb root, hasn't changed. But the classifier changing goes from seeing something general, seeing something specific, watching something. So that's generally how they work. SH is very, it's rare. And there are certain verbs, there's only a few verbs in their negative form, they actually jump to the, a different classifier. But once it's in a group, it usually just stays in that group. So now that it's in that group, you have two different things here. You've got what we call minus i and plus i. That's the classifier being like an on-off switch. It's two locations, on or off. Minus i means it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't reached its completion. Plus i means it has reached its completion. Plus i is the more rare one. It'll be perfected first. Right? Yeah, A, it's good. And it's good because it's, it's become good already. It's there. Right? The minus i means it has not reached completion. So the minus i you're going to see in future forms. You're going to see in negative forms. And you're going to see in a lot of other forms to say, well, it, it's not done yet. Whatever. So it has to do with completion. The other factor is plus d and minus d. And this is a little bit cloudier, I think, when you're going from speaking English, especially if it's only English speaking. So English prefers very clear subjects, very clear objects. Right? But who did what to whom? But you know, and so if you say um, I told on her. Right? I told on myself, which is weird. Or I talked to myself, or I um, wrote on myself, I cut myself, whatever. Doing something to yourself. This is called a reflexive action. Somebody to do something to themselves. In Clinket, that gets marked by shifting over to plus D. Right, so you could say, "Ich sechan, I love you." Chet chet zechan, I love myself. Chet chet zechan. That's a. You don't want to say that. That's a bad thing to say. But you could say, "Wush tut zechan," and it moves from the S group, switches over to the S plus D group. Right, the Ich sechan S I. Right, has reached that state. Wush We love each other, and we're all affected by it. So that's the biggest thing that plus D is the same. Is the subject affected by the verb? Because there's a number of verbs that are just naturally plus D to respect someone, to talk, to converse, to tell a story. And my recommendation is just keep an eye out now on these verbs as you start picking more verbs to learn. Then what classifier group is it? Because then you're going to move back and forth. Uh, the other thing that it could do is if you say, uh, 
he or she, you know, he or she is reading a paper or a book. But then you can say uh, to whom he or she is reading. So you're taking a verb that has an object there, but you're kicking the object out just to make the verb very general. Enough grammar stuff. I'm going to move on to uh, looking at these weather verbs again. But now that we've talked about the classifier a little bit, and you guys have the handout, uh, this is what I like to do. We've only got seven minutes, so we're going to have to go back. <laughs> I'm going to say this verb uh, twice, and we're, we're all going to repeat it. And then we'll go one at a time. You'll say the verb. Let's look at the phrase. You'll say it. And then you'll tell me what the verb root is and what the verb classifier is. Okay? And I'll help you. It's okay. Just take good guesses. The other thing to note is they're all listed right there. But you see the y yeah with the two dots over it? And that sound a long time ago was like nya. Yeah. Right? It was this nasal sound. It doesn't exist in Klinket anymore. But what happened is it morphed into a different sound. It's yet, like yeti. But if there's a O, or if there's a U or a double O, rounded vowel before it, it will turn into a W. Right? So if you say, um, well, I'll just. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Right, so it could be yeah or it could be what. But if I say what's the classifier, you would say it's the yeah. That's, that's how you refer. Yeah. Okay. Everybody repeat after me. What's up, Kuwati? What's up, Kuwati? What's up, Kuwati? What's up, Kuwati? This is super. Let's say it first. Oh, sorry. What's up, Kuwa T? The to be reclassified. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Kuwa K. 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 And then the classifier. Um, yeah. And K means good or, or fun. Alright, thanks. Out the gun. 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 Gone. 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 And the plus five. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's a plus D. There's a few there. Just sort of just throw it out there. Yeah, that's plus D. Goods. Push the 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 goods. The root. Oh, push the goods. And the root is goose. Uh, and the classifier is sh. 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 Yep. sh. Excellent. For class visitors, it's completely optional if you want to try it. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So whenever you have "kuwa," it's "yeah," because okay. the "ku" changes it into a "w." Right. And and this this used to be the same. Kuya. Yeah. In in Sikha they say "kuya ta," and so they would they would say "kuya ta," uh, and there are some communities that do that. Long time ago, this would happen for most of the wise out there, like "do yeti his or her child." Do what do you That's what they'd say a long time ago. Oh, that's that's I mean, that's shit. Uh, and ah means to be hot or warm. 
Pussyot. 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 Yeah, so the SI would be the classifier, sick, and the root would be odd. And odd means to be cold. <coughs> so we're going to see this meaning tucked in there at the end. Uh, if we've done these ones, we'll just go through them each once. Again. Again. Ah. Ah. All right. Plate da usetan. 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 Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, ton is the root, mm -hmm. and uh, SI is the classifier. Correct. And that ton means to precipitate. Doc right. is a directional thing to say downward from the sky to the earth, but it also means from the, sea, from the shore out to sea, or from like say in the woods out into the open. Uh, okay, we'll just say all of these real quick. See you, dog. Who's the ton? See you, dog. Who's the ton? Pedas, dog. Who's the ton? Pedas, dog. Who's the ton? Shaheen, dog. Who's the ton? Kasecha, dog. Who's the ton? Kasecha, dog. <laughs> yeah, uh, was is the uh, root for foggy, and uh, de is the classifier. Yeah, and so now it's plus D. Fascinating. Uh, <laughs> and how does that how does that make sense though if it's re um, reciprocal? It, yeah, it's reflexive, and I don't know why fog would be reflexive. Because maybe, maybe because it just affects the it affects the weather itself. Like maybe you can't see what else is there. Um, I don't know how it would. I don't know how the weather gets to be reflexive. The sun. The sun. The sun is as well because it's burning. Right? It's burning itself. Right. Um, a yao de tea. That one is, is as well. And so the plus D, because uh, you know, the wind pushes it. For a yao de T, the thing we'll do tomorrow is, is we'll start looking at these other components that are built in there. So we've talked about you know, breaking down how this thing functions. We said there's root, there's classifier. Just behind the classifier, there's the subject. Then there's this group of things we call thematic prefixes. And the, ones, the first ones we're going to look at is a whole bunch of them. What we're going to look at cup which means a horizontal surface. So if we pull it out of the verb completely, it kind of means on something, right? And adopt cut My cup arrives on top of the table. And then yet means the vertical surface. So we've got these two planes in the language that are very important. We're going to see some of these verbs have both of them. A yuck like done like Vertical sheets of snow coming down, piling up. That's how I think of it. A yao de pi. The trees are vertical, but the, the wind is moving them around and making them go. That's, that's how I think of this. Uh, and so as you start going and looking more at these verbs, we'll, we'll pull them apart and then we'll, we'll wrap up our semester. Next semester, we'll, we'll do more of this and we'll get into more conversational things and how to start. Continuing to produce language as well. Which way? Teach. 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 Yay. Bushy got this at me. Ah. Ah.